Welcome. I'm Nancy Wilhelms. I'm the executive director of Anderson Ranch, and we're really delighted to have you here today for what will be another outstanding program. Before we begin our presentation, I'd like to thank our presenting sponsor, Toby Devon Lewis. And I'd also like to thank our corporate sponsors, Douglas Elliman Real Estate, our premier sponsor this summer, and Christie's, Cultured Magazine, and the Weston Snowmass Resort. I'd like to give a round of applause for all. And I'd also like to thank our National Council sponsors and other supporters of today's program. So in a moment, I'm going to bring up Larry Fields, uh, who's going to introduce our speakers. Larry and his wife, Marilyn, are longtime friends of Anderson Ranch. In fact, I was just talking with them Marilyn mentioned that their house is full of artworks by their daughter, who is today, and I think done in the children's program, she is today 31 years old. So thank you for keeping those around the house, Marilyn. <laughs> All right. Uh, your Picassos, absolutely. So Larry and Marilyn are National Council members, and they're supporters of the Summer Series program. And they're important art collectors from Chicago, where they're deeply involved with the Museum of Contemporary Art there and the lively scene. Um, they're also lots of fun to be with, and I'd like to welcome Larry up to the podium to make some introductions. Please welcome Larry Fields. Oh, this is almost the right height for me, but maybe not for Naomi. <laughs> Um, welcome, everybody. We're very excited to be here. As a Chicagoan, there's a special pride of place here for all, all the people from Chicago who have come and talked in the program. I'll just mention a few artists, Angel Otero, Theaster Gates, Nick Cave, MacArthur Binion, and last year we had uh, William O'Brien, who actually had a show at the MCA that was curated by Naomi Beckwith not, not too long ago. So there's a lot of connection between Chicago and here. Uh, I'm supposed to introduce uh, Naomi, but uh, I wanted to say a quick word about Inajeka. I, I probably got the name wrong again, but I wanted to know a little thing about her, so I went on this thing called Google, and uh, I know that she's from Nigeria and tries to do these collages of interiors where it meshes pop Nigerian with old masters. So I Googled Crosby pop culture old masters in America. And I didn't realize that she was the lead singer in Crosby, Nash, Stills and Young. <laughs> I didn't know your musical equality went that way. But I went further and found out that a few years ago, in 2017, she won the Paul McCartney Genius Award. Uh, not Paul McCartney. Oh, no, it's a MacArthur Award. That's right. <laughs> She loves the music. I thought there was a connection there. <laughs> so anyway, Naomi will tell you more about all what she does, but I just thought that was interesting. Say, <laughs> Na Naomi Beckwith. Naomi Beckwith has uh, uh, been in the Museum of Contemporary Art now for 11 years in Chicago. It's been a full circle operation. She grew up in the south side of Chicago in Hyde Park, went to the north side, and went to school at Northwestern University. From there, she decided to spread her wings and go to England. We're at the Courtour. Let's go, let's go. Yeah. At the Couture Day, she had a master's, uh, a distinguished master's award in the Master of Arts. And for her thesis, did uh, Carrie Mee Weems and Adrian Piper, uh, two uh, distinguished artists today. And a flash forward, uh, she just finished up an exhibition of Howard Dina Pindell, which was uh, greatly reviewed and critically acclaimed. Um, from there, she came back to the United States, was involved with the Whitney Fellowship at a, a curatorial and worked at the ICA, uh, wound up going to an amazing internship uh, with the uh, curatorial board at the Harlem Museum. Under Thelma Golden, uh, she's nurtured so many great people there and all got on to spread their wings. The artists are too long to name who've come out of the program as well, a lot of which were uh, curated by Naomi and Naomi as well. So in 2011 from now, we've had a great relationship with Naomi Beckwith. Uh, she's vivacious, she's energetic, she's on top of her game. Uh, she has a presence about her that uh, may, makes you want to pay more attention because you know you're going to learn something. I guess the only thing bad I can tell you is that she's a little taller than I would like. Uh, <laughs> uh, but I've always looked up to her, so that's a good thing. <laughs> 
So um, her presence and her gravitas precede herself. Uh, we watch her grow into the curatorial position she is. She is now a curator's curator and has done great shows, not only of William uh, O'Brien and uh, also of Howard Dina Pendel, but the Freedom Principle and a few others from New York that are still living today in people's minds. So very important, very influential. I would now like to turn you over to Naomi Beckwith of Chicago's MCA. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Afternoon, everyone. Uh, hi. I just want to let you know, Larry, um, that I'm not taking off my heels <laughs> for this talk, so I will be taller than normal. And I asked Injadeka to come up with me, um, even though I was just introduced by Larry alone. And thank you for those really beautiful words. Larry comes with jokes, but he always comes with a warmth of spirit that I have learned to love and cherish. And so, as always, I thank you and Marilyn for all your support. Um, I have the task of introducing an incredible woman, an incredible young woman who is an even more incredible artist, Injadeka Akunyili Crosby. So you'll have to forgive me, Larry has this in incredible mental capacity to speak from, from the <laughs> chest, but I'm gonna have to read a little bit because there, there are too many accomplishments for me to just memorize. Well, Injadeka was born in Nigeria in the southern region of Enugu in 1983. And she came to the States for her education, where in 2004, she received a BA, a double BA, I should mm -hmm. say, uh, in studio practice from Swarthmore College, but also in biology. So we're especially excited to be here today as two biology yeah. majors in undergrad <laughs> who have found the light <laughs> and now come over into the art world. From there, she did a post-bac degree at the Pennsylvania Academy of Fine Arts, um, where I assume you studied painting there. Mm -hmm. It's a well-known painting school in Philadelphia. Um, and then went on getting to get her MFA in painting from Yale in 2011. And many of you, of course, knew her career immediately after that degree in Yale. Following uh, Yale, she went to the Studio Museum in Harlem for the Artist in Residence program, sadly, right after I left, so mm -hmm. we could have been better friends all this time. And then from there, it was straight into the sky. Um, you know of her many shows, I think, but I'll just, uh, I'll just renumerate a few of them. She's had several exhibitions at many international venues, uh, including the Whitney Museum, the New Museum, and the Bronx Museum in New York. She's also shown at the National Museum at the Duke University in, in North Carolina. Um, and she's been uh, shown in the La Biennale de, de Montreal in Canada and the Modern, Art, um, the Modern Art Institute in Oxford. And of course, many of those institutes have collected her, so she is shown in several international collections. Recent exhibitions, solo exhibitions especially, include Counterparts. That was at the Baltimore Art Museum just last year. Um, and last year she also showed predecessors at the Contemporary Arts Museum in Cincinnati and the Tang Museum at Skidmore College in Saratoga Springs. Um, the year before, she showed a solo exhibition called Portals at Victoria Miro um, and was in a show called I Refuse to Be Invisible at the Norton Museum of Art in West Palm Beach, Florida. Um, oh, also that year there was an incredible show that we'll talk about later called The Beautiful Ones at Art and Practice in Los Angeles, which coincided with another simultaneous exhibition at the Hammer Museum. And of course, all of this wonderful work and all these incredible shows have garnered many prizes for Indijeka. Um, and you should know that she was shortlisted for the Future, Arts, um, Future Generation Art Prize last year. Um, and the year before, she was the recipient of the Financial Times Women of the Year Award, as well as the Prix Constant Prize uh, in 2016. She was named a foreign policy uh, learning. So, pardon? Oh, no. sorry, sorry. <laughs> I know. It gets so long, I forget who you are. No? <laughs> she was named a foreign policy leading 100 global thinker in uh, 2015, where she also received the Next Generation Prize from the New Museum. Um, and in 2014, she received the Smithsonian Museum of Arts James Dickey Contemporary Art Prize as well. And in, we all know that she is now a certified genius having won um, 
in 2017, the MacArthur Foundation's Genius Grant. So I present to you probably one of the loveliest, <laughs> accomplished, and smartest contemporary artists in America working today. Welcome in Judaka. Thank you. Thanks for that <laughs> nice introduction that has now made me nervous. <laughs> <laughs> I thought that um, we would start this discussion with an early work. I like to tease Njadeka because I feel as though she's like Athena, that she popped out of the head of Zeus, fully formed, with this incredible mature body of work, and I search very hard. I know! <laughs> I saw it and I thought, where did you get that from? I'm good, I'm good. Um, and so I search very hard to find an early work. Um, and Njadeka, I would love for you to talk with us right now about this work, what it is, and really what inspired it. Yeah, so this is one of the early works that I've kind of like hoped to die a quiet death, but they're slowly <laughs> popping up now. And every once in a while, I'll see one online and go, oh, God, no, go back into hiding. <laughs> um, so this is a piece I finished like a few months, the year before I went to graduate school. And it's one of those things that even though it looks very different from what I'm doing now, I do love showing work from this time when I talk to schools, especially undergrads because I do want to combat that myth of like um, artists come fully formed and we know what we wanted to do from when we were 10, it's mm. not true. So at this point, there were things that I do now that looking back, I already see were, were there, um, which is that drawing has always been a strong component of what I'm doing. People in domestic spaces, especially me or people I know in spaces I've lived and I'm familiar with. So this was based off um, my studio slash extra bedroom when we lived in Philadelphia, mm -hmm. but also knowing that I was interested in making work about my life, but really wanting elements from Nigeria to come into it. So even though it's not very obvious in this one, the skirt I'm wearing is um, from a Nigerian designer called Jewel by Lisa. I had just come back from a trip to Nigeria where I discovered her and I was very excited and I bought a number of outfits and wanted to incorporate them into the work. Um, I think there's something really beautiful here, though, that you start to see immediately in uh, the later work that's always amazed me about your practice. And one is there's a really beautiful quality of light in these objects. You can't really quite tell where the light source comes from. There's these lovely contrasts here, and some of these things look really translucent. And what's amazing is that, that even though you sort of uh, advance in media, you see those things coming through in works that follow yeah, immediately so afterwards. If, if you go back <laughs> to that or, um, early picture, the first one, mm -hmm. may I please use the, uh, sure. the thingy? Yeah, this. And I want to say no. just something that I see I'm doing here that carries on is I'm very interested in um, breaking the work down into shapes. And so when I'm doing the planning or the drawing for the works, I'm thinking of how I can break a rectangle into interesting shapes and how different things can group or break out. So I'm playing with passage and silhouettes in certain areas. And so in this one, you know, like grouping the duck on her skirt into, the sh into her feet, into the shadow, and all into this closet, and all those just like shoop into one shape. And then going back to this one, um, like I remember when I planned this piece, I knew I wanted her whole body to be this curved singular shape that came into the chair and into the pants. It was meant to go into the floor, but then I changed my mind on it. Um, so the way I've constructed or orchestrated a composition has been constant since then. Mm. And it's a very classic way of constructing compositions as well. And even though they look very narrative, it seems as though it's not so much a story you want to tell, even though that's an important part of it, but it's also about the shapes that you want to come through and the organization of these, of these canvases that are very important to you. Mm -hmm. I'm also really interested in the way you treat the figures. Sometimes they're treated somewhat naturally, so you have a skin tone that might be closer to like a realistic life skin tone. And then other times you actually treat the figures like part of the background or as if they're a piece of the landscape. So here one figure is, is a collage and the other figure has natural tones. Um, does that have any significance? So I think sometimes it, it actually happens in the planning of it. 
So I'm trying to remember the decisions I made for this. When I was planning this and trying to figure out where the transfer goes, I liked having it come from the top and go into her figure and mm. then kind of come down her arm and continue in on the bedspread. And I like this idea of having something be at once one shape and separate simultaneously. So because of having the transfers on her skin and the background, they group into one shape, but then based on the the glaze I put over her skin and the background, it takes this one single shape and separates it immediately. Mm -hmm. So you actually have this moment of tension where things are collapsing and separating at once. Um, so I wanted to do that because I knew I want, there was um, a, a subtle type of tension I wanted in this piece. Um, I wanted her to not be very specific Mm. And so that's why I try to simplify it so it's not really like this is in I it just becomes this is a female figure. Mm. And I wanted to make, um, so this was one of the early works where heavily about or based off this figure of the woman and the man, which are kind of a bit about me and my husband. So I wanted to make this very romantic piece of people in a very intimate situation and you're getting a glimpse into someone's private life. Um, but I also wanted it to have, um, to, to, to kind of feel loaded, mm. uh, like to have this tension to it. And uh, I liked giving her this hairstyle that is very rural Nigerian threaded hair. Um, so it really speaks to like, a girl from the village um, because I also in my work I'm thinking of all the different characters I've inhabited in my life I grew up in a small eastern town I went to school in Lagos which is a big metropolis when I was growing up I used to spend summers in the village with my grandmother so I've really like experienced different spaces in my life and in the work I'm trying to make reference to that so the hairstyle makes reference to my roots as like a Bush Nigerian girl, mm -hmm. but then I'm also with a white man, which speaks to having left Nigeria and living this cosmopolitan life. So really trying to create this character that you, if you can break the clues down and read um, the, little, the, the notes I'm giving you, you're not quite sure who this person is. Mm. And um, so that's why I made the decision to put transfers on her. Ah, that's interesting. And for him, he's just, I, I, like, I wanted him to be more like a, a landscape, um, just like an abstract body. Swab of color. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I mean, it's interesting that you bring up tension, which I think comes with this kind of intimacy that you talk about. And there's a lot of tension in this work, the first one being, as a viewer, why are we looking at someone making love, <laughs> essentially? And so you feel like a voyeur mm -hmm. as you're looking at this work. And again, of course, there is this question of like, who are these people? What is happening racially? What is happening nationally? How did they come together? And I think it's a tension you hold rather well and it becomes in many ways almost a test mm -hmm. for the viewer as much as it is uh, a beautiful scene. Um, I wanna talk about one more sort of formal aspect too before okay. we think about other themes. And that is you also jump into collage at this point, um, a couple years after that first work we saw, which in many ways is a drawing, but it looks like a photograph. And it goes from straight photograph to collage, and collage really becomes a working way for you from this point on out. Um, and I'd love to you, for you to talk to us about what collage means for you. You're talking about from the very first work, the yeah, witch doctor. Yeah, from the very first oh, yeah, yeah. one. I am not a witch doctor. Yes. <laughs> this character, I mean, this looks like yes. a so photorealistic drawing. This is what I was doing before I went to grad school. I was doing drawings like this, but I was also doing paintings like this, like fully modeled oil paintings on lead, ground, linen. Um, so when I went to grad school, I, f I mean, the reason why I decided to go to grad school when I did is I felt I had reached the limit of what I could do by myself, hmm. and I needed help to break out my practice. I had ideas of what I wanted to say and where I wanted to go, but my work was not doing that. And so I wanted to be in a very intense environment with lots of critical discussions around me, and I could really begin to delve into those things more. And so when I went to grad school, I was still doing the fully rendered charcoal drawings and the charcoal paintings. But at that point, I had also been away from Nigeria for 10 years. 
So I was missing it a lot. And every time I went back home, I'll take a lot of pictures, I'll collect a lot of magazines. So I wasn't just missing it because I grew up there. I was also aware that it was a country that was moving away from me. Mm. Um, because, I mean, you've been to Lagos. It's fast. It's super it fast. changes yeah. every month. Mm -hmm. So I felt like every time I went back home, I encountered a different country. And I became aware of being more and more an outsider every year. So I felt like I had to hang on to this, like you are not leaving me. And the way I kept like made myself stay connected to home was through pictures. Mm -hmm. Thankfully, this was also when social, med social media exploded. So I started picking up a lot of pictures um, on the internet and following my friends and following Nigerian um, social blogs just to know what was going on, the slangs, the movies, the music. Um, this is also when Nigerian literature is exploding. Mm. And so I got to a point in graduate school where I will have visits with my faculty members and I'll have the painting on the wall and the drawing on the wall and somehow all my pictures were always kind of on the floor tacked up on the wall. And the conversation always ended up being about the photographs. Uh -huh. And I think it's one of those things that became obvious to my faculty members before it became obvious to me that those pictures I had collected and still collect, were still collecting were important enough to me that it had to be a part of the work. Yes. But you know, the part of me that came from the Pennsylvania Academy was just like, no, this is not how you paint, or this is not how you draw. And I think that's where um, really beginning to look at people like Wenge Chimutu, mm -hmm. or even someone like Kerry James Marshall, because they had a, um, a painting of his at the Yale Museum, and I still remember the first day I saw it. And I think what seeing them and studying them and having them as um, you know, my mentors through books um, did for me is that it made me realize that you had so much freedom to break yes. the rules you had been given, yes. and it's not something that should tie you down to what you were doing. And so once I made peace with that, it became obvious to me that the pictures had to come into the work. And then the next semester was really trying to figure out how do I incorporate these photographs into the work. So I actually went through multiple iterations um, that hopefully people will never see. There are a few <laughs> out there that I'm still terrified will come up um, before I, I got on the transfer. So it was one of those things where I, I had an idea of what I wanted. I knew I didn't want to cut and collage the pictures. Right. I wanted them to feel seamless, to be part of the, the work itself. And so I was trying to figure out how to do it. And I went through like one experiment where I actually pencil drew all the little photographs. It took months and my faculty members were just like, no, you cannot work like this. It's just like, it's not feasible for grad school. Ugh. And so I got to a point where I was trying to think of what to do. And I remembered a friend of mine from a printmaking class at the Pennsylvania Academy of the Fine Arts doing transfers. And so once I thought, oh yeah, there is that printmaking method where you can reproduce a photograph, I went on YouTube and I found it and I've been doing and it voila. since then. Technical expertise is important. You just spoke very specifically about um, the character we saw in the last painting <laughs> being kind of based on Indijeka but not being Indijeka. And there are moments where somebody who looks very much like Indy Jacket to me shows up. <laughs> and so I'd like to know who is this? <laughs> yeah, I always feel so. Um, I, I, now I, I have people who help me out in my studio, and I always, every once in a while, I find myself wondering what they think about me, like if they think, my God, she's confused. <laughs> because like, we'll be, I'll, like right now I'm working on something with multiple, multiple figures and one of them clearly looks like me. And I'll just go through this long process of saying, oh, can you please blah, blah, blah of the girl in the black shirt sitting in the cane chair. You know, when I could just say like me, Okay. <laughs> I'll just say like Justin, who is my husband, I'll be like, no, no, the guy with the striped shirt sitting on the other chair. Um, but I, I do those weird language things because it helps me remember um, or keep them separate in my mind. So in all the works, they are based off me. Um, a lot of them, my husband and I will pose and I'll use a clicker to take the pictures. 
And when it's multiple pe people, it's actually just two of us running around to different positions. Wow. And then I draw them all together. And I think what it is, is like it's based off my life and being a, someone who was born in Nigeria, moved around Nigeria, and is now living in the United States, and is American and Nigerian at the same time. But I feel like it's a narrative that is bigger than just my life experience. Um, so I, it's, it's more like um, the, the woman <laughs> and mm. not just in Jideka. But also, this is going to be a weird way to explain it, and it feels boastful, but it's not. I always think of it like she's to me as Sasha Fierce is to, to Beyonce. Be <laughs> <laughs> uh, it's like my alter ego because if you go back to the, this one, for instance, I've not had that hairstyle since I was about 10 years old. Oh. Um, so there are certain things that I do to the character with the hairstyle, with the clothes. Um, I've given her tribal marks before that I don't have. So it doesn't really feel like me. Mm -hmm. um, but I give it to the character to speak to something. So with this, the hairstyle is speaking to my identity that has to do with being um, like a, a village girl. But even though I've not been that in a long time. Mm. So things like that. I don't think that's boastful at all. I think that's also... <laughs> An I immigration like it's condition. Me to be honest. <laughs> so that's a part I'm just like. Ee. Somebody in the beehive is mad right now. <laughs> but I think we get it. I think it's important to always remember that a work of art is a work of fiction. Yes. Even exactly. if it's based on real events, it is always exactly. an interpretation, a representation, and a refiguring of something that may have happened. So I think of this as a fictional portrayal, even if it could have really happened. And I think that's also very important when we start to ask of art sometimes to explain the world to us. And we have to remember that art can only go so far. It can set up conditions mm -hmm. and maybe tell you certain stories about the world, but it's not a documentary practice. Yes. Um, this image, which is incredible, is also uh, right now a massive public mural in Los Angeles as part of the Eli Mocha Geffen project. Um, it is really incredible and one of the themes that runs through your work that is super important, I realize, is um, the idea of family, both your, within your immediate family of your husband, um, but also this kind of line of women in your family back in Nigeria. And I'd love to you to talk, for, to, for you to talk to us too about the importance of your mothers, your grandmothers, this sort of matrilineal line at, um, in home in Nigeria. Um, yes, I think I've done a number of pieces that keep speaking to my mother or my grandmothers. Um, so of my four grandparents, I really only met my father's mother. And she's the one I spent summers with. She was a big influence in my life. Um, I spent a lot of weekends with her. So she's the, that part of the family and her, the reason why I feel like I'm connected to my identity as an Igbo person, which is the part of Nigeria I'm from in the East. I speak the language, I'm familiar with the customs and the traditional ceremonies and events because of um, that part of my history. And my mother is someone who, um, I don't know if you know much about her. I, tend I think to, it'd be important to talk I about her I tend to not form. talk a lot mm -hmm. about her. Uh, uh, because uh, I feel like I have different lives. There's my life in Nigeria and my life here, and I just realized I, I don't think I've ever talked about my life mm -hmm. in Nigeria in a talk before. Um, but I don't know. I'm you curious. Can talk when to you, me. Yeah, no, no, it's just the two of us. No, no, when, you, when you were in Nigeria, did anybody talk to you about my family? I'm curious. Maybe not. No one talked about your family, but I had heard. Oh, okay, okay. I'd heard whispers. Oh. <laughs> um, so I, um, now I'm going to do a story time. So I had a very fascinating thing happen to my family. So, okay, this is going to be long. I'm going to go back in time okay. um, just to give you an idea of the kind of person my mother was and why she's so important to me and why she's really made me who I am. Okay, now I have to like, keep it together. Um, but when I was young, my mother was working You can take I a don't moment. Talk about I know. It. No, it's okay. okay. So when I was young, my mother was working for the Petroleum Trust Fund, which is like a Nigerian 
I don't know, Nigerian oil conglomerate. Yeah, oil. So it was when Nigeria had a, when oil was 150 a barrel or whatever it was, and Nigeria had a lot of excess money coming from oil. So they were thinking, what should we do with this excess money instead of squandering it, we should start a trust fund where we put it in it and then we'll use it to do education, roads and things like that. And my mom has always been someone who worked hard to get the best for her family. We were not very rich. <laughs> you can take your time. Yeah. It's all right. I'm just gonna look down. No, take a um, so we were not very rich when we were growing up. And my mother was teaching at the university, but she was also doing lots of other jobs. So there was a job open at PTF as a secretary, and she applied for it, and she got it. Does someone have tissue? Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you very much. You're welcome. Thank you for that. Okay. okay, so my mother got the job as PTF, and so she became a government worker. And what happens if you're a government worker, because Nigeria has a lot of money, is that if, if you get sick, the government pays for it. So my mother got sick, and the PTF gave her money to go to London. So she went to Nigeria, a Nigerian hospital, and they did the diagnosis, and they said it was something pretty bad, and she had to have an operation. So the PTF, the Petroleum Trust Fund, told her they would pay for her to go to London. And so they had money already budgeted for it, say it was like 12,000 pounds. And this was like in the early 90s, so that is more than she would make in God knows how many years. So she was given 12,000 pounds to go to London and get the surgery. So she bought her plane ticket, she got to London, she went to the hospital, and they did the tests again, and the British doctor found out that she was misdiagnosed in Nigeria, and that she didn't have what they thought she had, and she didn't need the surgery. So at this point, there was about 10,000 pounds left over from the money, and even the doctor was like, you know, I can write you a fake receipt, and we can <laughs> share this money. And my mom was like, no, no, just give it back to me, I'll take it back to Nigeria. And of course, I'm sure the doctor thought, yeah, right. <laughs> and so my mom took this money and went back to Nigeria and returned it to PTF. And this was money nobody expected her to return. It's like, we've given it to you, you spend it, you don't spend it, it's your business. But that's the kind of person she was. So she returned it, more money than she would see in years. She returned it, she wasn't very rich, she moved on with her life. PTF ended up folding and she went back to teaching. And she just forgot about this. This wasn't a big deal for her, this is just like what you're meant to do. So that's how we were raised. So what she didn't realize is that unbeknownst to her, this story like spread through the PTF <laughs> ranks like wildfire. Kind of like, have you heard about that Igbo woman who returned 10,000? And I mean, the people were telling the story like, is something wrong with her mentally? <laughs> or is she that honest? Like right. nobody could believe it. And so the story kept spreading. And finally the, the story got to, to Sholeye, who was like good, he was pretty high up and he was good friends with someone who told him the story. And it was just the story he had heard and he didn't think much of it. Then years after that, um, the new president was Obasanjo. Mm -hmm. I mean, Obasanjo was hanging out with Sholeye and telling Sholeye like um, NAVDAQ, which is a Nigerian FDA, like NAVDAQ is very corrupt. People are selling a lot of substandard drugs or expire, you know, like things expire abroad and you ship it to Nigeria mm. instead of throwing them away <laughs> in terms of like medicine or like medicine that isn't um, effective. Right. You send it to Africa. You know, we're just like a dumping ground for everybody. And NAVDAQ, it was meant to be the control for that, but <laughs> you bribe someone and they let you bring whatever into the country. So. You're, you get, and that's why people leave the country when they're sick. So you mm. get sick and you're taking medicine, but nothing happens right. and you die. So Basanja was just saying, this is horrible. NAVDAQ is too corrupt. I need someone to clean it up. I need someone who is really honest. And Shole went, well, <laughs> if you're looking for an honest person, 
I have a story for you. Uh, 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 uh. <laughs> and so he told him about this 10,000 pounds from years ago. And we were all at home the day the president called the house. Oh my God. We still all remember this. And I think we like dropped the first time, like, ha 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 ha, Ambassador <laughs> is calling. I mean, we were like nobody family from Eastern Nigeria. <laughs> And finally, my mom picked, and he was like, this is Obasanjo. Come to Abuja, bring your papers. And I mean, like, you can't believe what you're hearing. You're going to make me the head of an organization that I've not run anything before. So she, she ran went. a large family, though, so she yeah. did something. <laughs> and so they gave her the job. I mean, we all knew she could do it, but I didn't know if people would trust that she could do it. And so she got the job, and she ended up doing an incredible job. She was, been, she was written up in... Time Magazine, Newsweek, New York Times, Wall Street Journal. She was the first African to win Transparency International Award exactly. because she was very honest. Mm -hmm. and, um, was known for like not taking bribe, but she was someone who just um, believed that there was so much in life that was worth more than money. Mm. And most of it was your integrity. Like if you lose that, money can buy it back. And so I feel like so much of who I am and the lessons I've got in life are from her, so I do make a lot of references to her. So this piece is called Before, Now, and After, Mama, Mommy, and Mama. So Mama is my grandmother, and the things on the table speak to her, because when I went back to Nigeria in 2012, I went to my grandmother's house in the village. She had died by then. And the house was locked up, but I got them to open it for me, and I took a number of photographs, and everything was still how she left it when she was alive. So I used this, and you'll see it in some other works. I used the images on the table, usually as a stand-in for her. But she's also the person in blue on that big, that's her over here. Um, so this is a stand-in for her. This is my sister. So this is a situation where I didn't use myself, I used my sister, so it's, that's why I say the girl. Um, but she stands for me, my generation. Um, this is my sister, we call her Mama. And this is my mom when she was a little kid. So it's actually like three generations of women. Uh, thank you for sharing that, I know that was tough. <laughs> <laughs> It's a beautiful lesson and a beautiful part of who you are. This is another beautiful one, moment, yeah, so too. So this is another one. <laughs> <Not me. laughs> so I added this one this morning because I was thinking of other works I've done that have had to do with generations. So this is another one. Um, so that's based off me sitting in a chair. Um, this is a photograph of, it was actually my mother's mother, who I never met, but I heard mm. so much of from my mother. And she's carrying the, the smallest child in the family, who uh. is actually connected to my mom's story with Navdak and everything, because she's, um, her name is Auntie Mwogo. Mwogo was diabetic, and she died in her early 20s, and it, she died because of fake insulin. Mm. And that was also why my mom was very passionate about her job for Navdak, just feeling like, I don't want this to happen to any other person. Mm. Um, so that's that. And this is um, fabric from when my mom ran for Senate. So it has um, my mom's mother, my mom, and me, um, the three generations again. And I mean, there are other things going on. There's this like interior that is based off of a Hamashoi painting. And you see the Hamashoi reference in here again. Um, and, like slight references to William Bailey and other painters that I like. Absolutely. But I, I keep going back to these generations. You go back to generations, but you also make these backgrounds and backdrops, as you say, mm -hmm. very much part of the story as well. And, and I'm really interested in the way that you don't just do portraits of people. You don't have these generational lines. You place each painting in a specific time and place. And I'm super interested around, about these backdrops and the elements that repeat themselves there i.e. we've seen your grandmother mm -hmm. again in this painting. Um, what are the things that you come back to over and over again in terms of uh, setting a place for us? Yeah, so I've noticed like, now when I look back and look at my work, 
I've noticed that there are certain things that reoccur. So it's almost like I'm building a lexicon. Mm -hmm. So they are definitely the objects on the table. And the objects on the table actually divide into two. Do you want they this? are the, oh. yeah, and there's one you'll see later on. So they are the objects of, on the table from the photographs I took of my grandmother's house. And then there's another set of objects on the table that you'll see later on that is based off of having breakfast in Enugu. I don't know if you had breakfast in Nigeria, tea and bread. Uh, but no. it's very different kind of tea from anywhere else. It's actually hot chocolate. <laughs> and you have like the, 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 the bread block. You um, dip in the... Yeah, you dip <laughs> it in the tea and it's like cake. Um, so this is one of it. Another lexicon I've been developing are the plants. So I don't, I don't think there's one here earlier, but I've been, you can see it's a little bit going on in the background behind her, but I've been doing a lot of windows in a space looking out to plants. So with the work, I've been thinking of how the figures, like mm -hmm. how you can, ah, sorry, can you? <laughs> go back. Um, actually, no, you don't have mm -hmm. to go back one way, but I've been thinking of how when I create a character, I can kind of speak to this person that has inhabited different spaces. You know, if I give her a traditional um, rural hairstyle, but then she's wearing an outfit by a very high-end Lagos designer, but then she's wearing like slippers, you buy cheaply from the market. You really have this sense of this woman is, it can be put in a box. I don't really understand how she fits. Mm. So what I've been doing in the last, two, three years is trying to take what I do with the characters and extend that into the space, into the architectural space, into the interior space, but also take it into the outside. So how can a space, a room, without a figure be a portrait of a place? What are the fixtures you put in the room? What is the light switch like? How does a fan box tell you where you are? Um, because the, the way you turn on a fan in Nigeria is very different from the way you turn it on here. Um, we use fan boxes in Nigeria, but also how does a certain fan box let you know if you're in a Nigerian room from the 80s or mm. from right now? Things change. So thinking of how those things carry specificity. And then moving to the outside, I've been doing um, a lot of work with plants and really researching them more and being aware of how plants also carry specificity. Um, so a plant I've been using a lot is this middle plant right here with the red stem, which is called a cassava. Mm -hmm. So not only do you see, like, the only place I really see it is in Nigeria, but even within Nigeria, the only place I see it is in the village. So whenever we're driving from Enugu to the village, I know we've crossed into village territory once I start seeing cassavas because the root tuber makes up the big staple of um, a rural diet. Um, so that's that, but then I'll do things like um, put a cassava plant in with an Indian rubber plant, which is something you see in a lot of interiors in Los Angeles with their mid-century modern mm -hmm. um, look. Um, but also even look, thinking of the history of that, where the Indian rubber plant actually comes from um, India, but has now become naturalized to, to the United States. And then going to something like palm, which is the opposite of cassava in terms of specificity. Um, a palm, an image of a palm tree tells you nothing. Mm. There's palm in the village, there's palm in Lagos, there's palm in Dubai, there's palm in Oregon, there's palm in LA, like <laughs> I don't know where it can be. So really thinking of how you can use plans to, to kind of men be specific at a, about a place or complicated place. Um, so I've really enjoyed doing the window scenes because mm, of that. That's beautiful. We may have to open it up to questions oh, soon. Oh. Um, so I thought I might sort of flip through a few things quickly and jump right into the beautiful okay. ones and then we'll, we'll open it up to questions after that. Um, just wanted to show a little bit more about these interiors and the strange things that you can do with space how you repeat certain patterns and things over and over again, and how there's a way in which you're often, as you say, sort of located indoors, but often even looking elsewhere, and that we as a viewer are kind of an interloper in the mm -hmm. space as well. Um, Injadeka and I also had a conversation about artists that we both find mm. really influential in thinking about place and artists mm. who very seriously work to put together these scenarios that put you in a very specific place. In this case, Carrie James Marshall takes you to the south side of mm -hmm. Chicago. I saw this painting and literally thought, 
oh my god, how he, how does he know my grandmother's house? Ah. <laughs> um, See, I love that feeling. Micheline Thomas, another painter who does incredible portraiture, but who's constantly making these kind of fictitious backgrounds that speak toward a kind of mm -hmm. 70s vibe Actually, of when, excess. Uh, sorry, so whenever mm -hmm. I teach and I show students Micheline's work, I always ask them to guess what time period it's from. Nobody, Nobody has ever can, failed it. No. And that just shows it's so specific. Exactly. Lori Simmons is another one who really has put together um, um, a, a career really looking back at uh, post-war American suburbia and what happens in its aftermath. And even though, again, they're dollhouses, they're play, they're fiction, what do you get? You get a very specific place at a very specific time. And we're both big fans of Herbert Anderson, uh, a British painter who, like you, loves to create scenes that are set in interiors that look out and who can do portraiture incredibly well, but is more interested in place and time and texture and setting. And lastly, I wanted to talk a little bit about the Beautiful One series, a solo show of yours. Um, a series that's looking really to the future mm -hmm. um, and also has an incredible title. So if you could, you know, in a couple minutes, talk to us about that before <laughs> yes. we open it up um, for So questions. the Beautiful Ones is like this, those two and some new ones I'm working on are going to be in a show coming up at the National Portrait Gallery in London that opens mid-November. Mm -hmm. So I started up with this one. And for a long time, I hadn't done straight up portraits. Like from grad school, I was kind of like trying to distance myself from my academy, like over modeling things. Sorry. So I was trying to simplify the figure a lot. And I went, I got to a point where I felt like I don't want to run away from things be out of fear. So instead of running away from portraits, I wanted to challenge myself to do one and just figure out a way to do it to make it interesting for me. So I actually started looking at Velasquez, so going back to the past to make something about the future or the present. And I found a Velasquez painting of Prince Balthasar Carlos, and mm. I liked the design of it, where it was a really dark painting, and you see the, the prince's head and his arms. He's wearing white sleeves. And so just having the sleeves and his hands and his head be these light shapes kind of abstractly floating in this dark field. And I wanted to play on that. So I knew I wanted my sister wearing a light outfit. So her head, legs, and arms were kind of these abstract shapes. Like if you squint, they're kind of just like not connected to anything mm. in the light blue field. And so I finished this, and I hadn't intended for it to be a series. But then I started thinking of making one for my brother. And it finally became a series. And now there are five of them. The title actually comes from a book title, which is The Beautiful Ones Are Not Yet Born. And it's one of the most popular books you read if you're growing up in West Africa and you're doing literature. And it's a book that was set in the 1960s in Ghana, but it's really talking about the loss of hope across West Africa. After all this wave of independence happened and people thought all these countries will become incredible and great. People thought Nigeria would be the giant of Africa. But then, of course, it was like military coup after the other from one country to the other, then corruption, and everything went downhill. So that's what the book is talking about. And I've been, in my work, I'm really thinking of this like cultural renaissance that is happening in Nigeria from art to industry to music to fashion to literature everywhere, and really thinking of how my generation is is slowly beginning to fulfill that dream people had in the 60s. Mm. So if that was like my parents' generation were the beautiful ones that were not yet born, hopefully my generation is it, or the beginning of it, or hopefully we've arrived. And so this has been a series of people in my generation as little children. Oh, fabulous, fabulous. Um, I don't know if we're raising the light, but um, we will raise the lights now. Um, and we're going to open the room up to questions. Uh, we are recording today, so I just ask that when I call on you, please wait for the microphone to come to you uh, for you to ask your questions. And we just ask for brevity as we have a full room today. And we want everyone to get a question in. So we have a question here on the left side of the room. Wait for Lily to bring the mic to you. Hi, my name is Nancy. I am thrilled with your work. I've never seen it, unfortunately, but I am beyond thrilled. I'm fascinated with the size that you create your art mm. and your photography that you use. I, in the painting before with the girl with the dress, I see there was shading with the photography. Sorry, go back one uh, more. I think it's, it's just going to loop around, sorry. Oh, okay. <laughs> um, 
I could understand how the photography is uh, collaged onto your uh, uh, board. In the dress, there's shading on it. Yes, so it goes back to this thing I'm, I, was talking, I was talking about earlier where I, I use the transfers to unify shapes and then I separate them with the overglaze or the shading I do on them. So with that one, if I remember correctly, what I did was I had the, the interior of the room behind her and her dress and the floor all transferred. So that kind of grouped it into one shape, but then I wanted to separate it at the same time. So the, the space behind her of the room got a dark transparent glaze over it mm. and her dress got a white transparent, I just kind of mix white paint with very, um, with a lot of medium, so it's a little bit milky and you can still see the transfers through it. And I put it over her dress many times. So like I wanted the dress to separate from her, her skin color. And then I went back in with colored pencils and shaded the creases in her dress. Mm. You're welcome. I'm going to jump from right to left, so we'll come here to the right side of the room. I find it very interesting that although Picabia and Rauschenberg and Sala used transparencies in their work, you have your own unique way of using it, and it's very identifiable, and that's something that I, I am impressed with. I also would like to know, in that last photo, was that supposed to be somewhat androgynous? Because the eyeglasses on her, from the neck up, I would have almost thought it was a man. Oh. And then the those slippers, hair. the satin slippers, which look like they came from uh, uh, France, uh, identified her as a woman. So was it meant to be androgynous or not? I liked that it was. <laughs> um, it was something I was thinking of, and I'm actually doing another piece similar to it. There's another beautiful one. And I think it's just um, how we grew up. We all, my, all my siblings and I, there were four girls and two boys, and we all had short cropped hair like that. Um, so <laughs> it's one of those things, like now I'm older and I think about it, and I don't even think my parents were aware of it, but they raised us pretty gender neutral but it was just out of necessity. You kind of wore whatever you inherited. Mm -hmm. So I wear a lot of my brother's clothes, mm -hmm. and it was cheaper to have short hair, so we all got short hair. Mm -hmm. A question here on the left. Thank you so much for the talk, and particularly for the story about your mother. Um, I was wondering if you'd be willing to talk more about how art functioned for you as a child, in terms of like your exposure to artists, your expression of art, um, the encouragement you got to pursue art in your own life. Mm -hmm. Thank you for the question. How at, so I have always drawn. Um, it was what I did for fun as a kid. I would find a newspaper or a magazine, get some charcoal from the outdoor like fireplace and just copy things. Um, but I actually didn't start doing painting, oil painting, until I came to the United States at 17. Um, so growing up in Nigeria, art was not part of my life at all, like in any way, shape or form. Apart from the things like I did to entertain myself, we also weren't very, weren't very well off, so I think it forced me to be creative. Um, like I remember my little sister wanted a doll, so I made a doll for her using like a ping pong ball and a matchbox, and, <laughs> and so that's like the extent of the creative things I was doing when I was young. And then I went to Lagos for high school, and Lagos is a big cosmopolitan city. And so every once in a while, my school would go to the museum. So we talked about the, like, the National Museum in Nigeria, but it's not an art museum. You see artifacts from like military coups. You went there, I the car with the bullet holes. Museum. It's not an art museum. <laughs> um, but we did learn a bit about some big Nigerian um, artists like um, Yusuf Grillo, Benemongo. Um, so that was the first time I stayed hearing about Nigerian artists and in Suka school, and I loved them, but still didn't think I was going to do anything with it. And then when I came to the United States at 17, um, I was taking classes at the Community College of Philadelphia, and they were all science-heavy classes, and I wanted something fun to do, just to lighten my load, and I took a painting class, and I've been doing art since then. Mm -hmm. wow. on the, any questions here? All right, we'll stay on this side. We'll start in the back and move to the front. Mm -hmm. 
I too want to thank you for a very inspiring talk and a wonderfully personal one. Mm -hmm. um, and and Dijika. Close. Um, <laughs> excuse me. Um, your uh, beautiful plant painting, that interest of yours. I saw that there were figures in the plants. Can you talk about where that comes from and relates to? Mm -hmm. Yes. Um, so I'm thinking of how the plant thing started. So the, the f I had done plants a few times, but I was doing this, so the, wh how it really started, and it's now become part of my toolbox, but if I kind of remember the first time, I had done this one piece that was a multi-figure work, people were around the table, and it was very busy, and I finished the work, but it didn't feel finished to me. I just felt like I wanted something else to happen to it. I wanted it to expand beyond what it was. So I decided to put a panel on either side of the work. So the panel on the right side was an interior with a television, which is now like led to those other new works. Mm. It was just like an interior with a television. And on the, the left side, I didn't know what to do. I knew that I wanted it to be very simple, not as noisy as the other panel, because I felt there was this like noise into quiet gradients that was happening. So I felt like I wanted that panel to be the quiet one. So I was thinking of something that had just like two shapes or three shapes, very simple, but even within that simplicity to be a little bit complex. So it ended up being a big window in a room, like the whole piece was just like a window with a plant in the corner. And so the window was just painted flat, the room was painted flat, and I, I just felt like it needed something else. And I was thinking of what that something else could be, and I decided to do transfers within the plant. But I wanted to use transfers in a way that was different from how I used it before. So instead of making lots of little pictures in it, I decided to, like what would happen if the transfer was just one figure? And so the last time I was in Nigeria, I had gone to the Vlisco headquarters, which is like the, they make the African fabric prints, and they had given me um, a book that was mm. like, um, like a celebration of their vintage prints. And there were some pictures in there that I really liked and I knew I wanted to use them at some point. So I ended up transferring them into the plants. And I liked how that turned out. And so since then, I've actually been making the plant more and more complicated. So the first one had just the Indian rubber plant with a figure in it. And this one has um, the Indian rubber plant, the cassava plant, and palm. And the one that went to the studio museum had like four plants in it. So just like every time I do it, it gets more complicated. And I know what I'm working towards in my head, even though it hasn't happened. I keep hoping that at some point, I'm going to make a big piece, like the size of those double doors, mm. um, that is just plants. <laughs> and it's, I, it's one of those things that it's almost impossible to explain how it happens, but it's very, very, very complete. It's so complicated, I make notes when I work on it. Wow. Because you think of like five plants being together, and then they're like all these logics you have to remember, like where plant one and plant three overlap, it has to be a transfer, but not where plant three overlaps with plant two. <laughs> Oh and, web, and, so it's, <laughs> and so it's like, how do you make them all different, but they all show up? And I like it because it becomes like a, a, a really intense puzzle that I have to solve. Wow, super logical. Do we have time for one more question? We promised one more right here in the front. Mm. Um, your, your Could you wait for the mic to come Sorry. to you, please? Yes. Uh, the personal honesty that you express both in your work and what you've expressed here in the talk is really courageous and emotionally so powerful and compelling. Thank you. Um, I, I noticed in, in a number of the um, beautiful one works that you use in the transfers uh, a lot of colonial images from uh, Nigeria. Could you comment a little bit about the thinking and, and if, if there's a particular social or political sort of intention that you have with using those images? Sure. Um, Sean, is it possible to make it so that I can click through it please, then I can use the points and points. 
Thank you. Oh, yes, Chairman. thank you. Mm. Okay, so, so this is the first beautiful one. And when I started it for the transfers, I wanted, um, I wanted there to be a journey. I wanted the transfers to tell a story or to, like, to have um, a time movement to them. Mm. So just as I'll just walk through this as an example of how I'll do transfers. So after I had the drawing down and I had the shape where I wanted the transfers to go, I started thinking, what do I want to do? What do I want these transfers to do? Um, so I knew that I wanted it to kind of move through time. And to echo that move through time, I wanted the color to do that. So it starts from black and white, and then it gets like sepia and a little bit of color, and then it gets really intense as it moves down. And when I started, I also wanted to use only pictures of people wearing white outfits. <laughs> Sadly, I couldn't keep that up. Um, so this is a photograph that I found in a book I own um, through African Eyes. It was a, a show that happened some years ago. And I was so excited to find this picture because I knew exactly what it was. This was something we used to see when we were growing up, but I haven't seen it in decades, it's this guy who dressed as a colonial master and came around and made kids laugh for entertainment. So he was like a traveling clown. And it was what people did to kind of feel like they were taking back power from when we used to be a British colony. And we called them Papa Lolo. But even when I search online, I can't find any image of it. Mm. And I saw it in this book. And he's wearing white. And then there's an image of the queen when she visited Nigeria inspecting the troops. Um, there's a picture of some little kids wearing white when they were waiting for the queen to come. And they're holding um, the Union Jack flags, um, waiting for her motor kid to pass by. I'm um, trying to find some other ones. There's one that's like of a, a Benin traditional ruler in there somewhere. I can't see it really well. So that's how it started. There's me in my first Holy Communion wearing my white outfit. Mm. My sister is in there somewhere also. That's her, there she is in front of the church in her first Holy Communion outfit. But I just got to a point where I had collected all I could, and I couldn't find enough white outfits to populate the piece. So I expanded it to like, OK, people kind of like posing, and they know they look good. <laughs> and so it expanded to other things. So just to follow that um, time change, it started from black and white and moved into the present. Um, but then, for instance, in this other one, even though I had a lot of pictures that were similar to the other one, um, I, I felt like um, a lot of outfits my brother wore always had like a military thing to them. And it's one of those things, like I don't know if it's just the, because we were a military, living in military dictatorship, it, it permeated like fashion without us even being aware of it. So I was thinking of how this thing has like weird military vibe to it, but there's also like a Michael Jackson vibe in terms of like how he's posing and his shoes. Yeah. So I was doing a play on that with the transfers. And Michael Jackson is someone that a lot of artists in Nigeria have imitated over the years, or he's just been really influential to us. So I was looking at pictures of musicians dressed like Michael Jackson, but also thinking of military outfits, and then finding other pictures of Nigerian musicians dressed in outfits that are military inspired mm. um, so that's how I populated this but also like wanting him to have this passage with this like garden jungle scene behind him and to kind of um, underscore that I was using a lot of transfers of plants as well um, so that's how this was populated it's also populated with a beautiful foray into abstraction yeah. which I think is amazing we didn't Halley. even get to that <laughs> yeah. Yeah, exactly <laughs> I cannot thank you enough, well, Intideka, for you. a beautiful <laughs> conversation. <laughs> thank you to Nancy, Ashley, oh, and the you. team, and Anderson Ranch as thank well. Thank you, Naomi. Thank you, Ejideka. Yeah.